É, bom dia, então, a todos. Vamos começar aqui a nossa segunda parte da reunião. É, hoje é uma participação muito especial. Teremos o doutor Alió e o doutor Brenner. Doutor Alió da Espanha, doutor Brenner atualmente na Noruega. Então, primeiramente, agradeço a participação dos dois. E vamos começar com a apresentação de um artigo que será feita pela doutora Marília. Então, Marília, por favor, fique à vontade. É, eu sou Marília, sou fela do serviço desse ano e eu vou apresentar o artigo científico de hoje, que é a, o título é a comparação dos resultados é, visuais, da, dos resultados de qualidade visual e satisfação é, dos pacientes em relação a três tipos de lente multifocal é, que foram inseridas. Esse estudo ele é coreano, foi publicado no Scientific Reports em setembro desse ano. Os autores declaram não ter nenhum é, interesse é, financeiro. E o que eles queriam saber é qual o método entre a opção do mix and match, das lentes bifocais e das, é, das edofes e das trifocais, qual proporcionaria melhor resultado visual, é, melhor qualidade visual e maior é, satisfação do paciente. Então, em relação aos métodos, foi um estudo comparativo, prospectivo, que foi feito na Coreia. Eles analisaram 120 olhos de 60 pacientes que foram operados por um único cirurgião. E eles foram divididos em três grupos, de acordo com a preferência dos pacientes em relação à cuidado visual para perto, intermediário e para longe. Então, o primeiro grupo foi uh, o do Mix and Match, que foi usado uma lente, eh, duas lentes difrativas, né, bifocais, uma com a, um poder de 2,75 para o olho dominante e 3,25 para o outro olho. O grupo das Edofes, né, que aí usaram a, a Symphony, que tem nove anéis uh, difrativos, que variam em altura e largura. E o grupo das Trifocais, que tinha um poder de 3,5 para perto, 1,75 para o intermediário, e tem essa apodização do, dos anéis difrativos que é, tentam melhorar a visão noturna. Os critérios de inclusão, eles é, operaram os pacientes com catarata senil bilateral, que tinham o desejo de ficar sem óculos para todas as distâncias, e excluíram os pacientes com um astigmatismo corneano maior que um, ou então que já tinham tido alguma outra cirurgia, ou trauma ocular, ou então outra comorbidade ocular. Ah, eles usaram o IOL Master, aí colocaram os dados do AL, da seratometria e da profundidade de câmara anterior na, nessas três fórmulas, e aí o target que eles usaram foi a emetropia, exceto para o olho não dominante do grupo das etofes, né, que eles fizeram uma micromonovisão. Em relação à avaliação do, do paciente, no pré-operatório eles fizeram a cuidado visual com correção e sem correção, a refração, o um exame de, em lâmpada de fenda e a fundoscopia. O pós-operatório eles avaliaram, avaliaram o paciente no primeiro dia, na primeira semana e depois com um e três meses. E com três meses eles avaliaram de novo a, a acuidade visual, a refração, a curva de defoco, a, a, a sensibilidade ao contraste, a performance de leitura, a, a satisfação e a dependência ou independência para óculos. Eles usaram um questionário para fazer isso. Em relação à acuidade visual, que foi avaliada aos três meses, eles fizeram com correção e sem correção uma distância de 5 metros, aí avaliaram a visão intermediária numa distância de 60 centímetros e 80 centímetros e a visão é, sem correção para perto com 33, 43 e 50 centímetros uh, utilizando a tabela de Snelling. Em relação à análise estatística, eles usaram esse, uh, o bom Ferroni uh, Correction, né? um nível de significância de P menor de 0,017. 
e fizeram essa análise de variância é, para as comparações no pós-operatório. Bom, então, em relação aos dados pré-operatórios pacientes, a gente vê que não teve diferença é, na idade, no sexo, no, na dioptria esférica, cilíndrica, ou então no equivalente esférico é, entre os grupos, mas teve, também não teve diferença em relação à acuidade visual para operatória não corrigida, mas teve diferença no grupo do mix and match, que eles tiveram uma, é, uma acuidade visual é, pré-operatória com correção melhor que os outros grupos. Ah, em relação à a, a refração dos pacientes, é, o grupo da EDOF, eles tiveram um maior é, equivalente esférico no olho dominante e também é, tive, no olho não dominante, o equivalente esférico o miópico também foi maior que o grupo do mix and match é, no, do grupo das trifocais. É, em relação à acuidade visual binocular com três meses é, depois da cirurgia, não teve diferença é, nos valores de acuidade visual é, para intermediário, porém, é, no o grupo da IDOF teve um, uma acuidade visual binocular é, um pouco pior para a distância de 33 centímetros. Bom, em relação à acuidade visual não corrigida, é, não corrigida para perto, intermediário e para distância, não teve diferença é, para distância intermediária ou então para longe, mas com 33 centímetros o grupo da IDOF teve essa acuidade visual binocular um pouco pior também do que o grupo da trifocal. Bom, em relação à curva de defocos, né, o, o grupo da, da Mix and Match, eles tiveram o Mix and Match em o, o, o trifocal, eles tiveram melhores resultados visuais com zero e menos duas dioptrias, mas eles tiveram algumas quedas nessa, nessa gama intermediária. E o grupo da IDOF, eles tiveram uma linha mais contínua de, de alcance visual, mas tiveram uma, um decréscimo progressivo né, na, quando, tive, quando tinha maiores é, níveis de defocos, e o grupo da, das trifocais, eles tiveram um, uma visão é, melhor é, para uma distância é, mais próxima do que o, o outro grupo da, da EDOF. E aí, em relação à profundidade de foco, o grupo do mix and matching da, das lentes trifocais, é, teve esse é, variou de 0 até menos 3 e o grupo da EDOF de 0 até menos 2, né? Então, o da EDOF teve uma menor profundidade de foco, de foco também. Em relação à sensibilidade ao contraste, é, nessa frequência de é, é, 3 CPDs, a condição fotópica, né? Uh, o grupo da EDOF teve pior uh, sensibilidade ao contraste do que o grupo da trifocal. E na condição mesópica, sem brilho, uh, o grupo da EDOF teve, de novo, uma, uma, uma menor sensibilidade ao contraste do que o mix and match. E na condição mesópica, sem glare, não teve diferença entre os grupos. Em relação a... Velocidade de leitura entre os grupos, uh, em relação ao logmar uh, de 1 e 0,4, não teve diferença uh, na velocidade de leitura entre os grupos, porém, uh, em relação uh, ao 0,3 de logmar, o mix and match uh, teve uma velocidade de leitura maior que os outros dois grupos. Uh, então, os pacientes eles foram submetidos a um questionário com três meses depois da cirurgia. Uh, 
Uh, e aí o, essa análise mostrou que a frequência de uh, glare, de uh, haze vision e blurred vision foi significante menor no grupo da mix and match. Em relação à satisfação geral, né, que também foi avaliada por um questionário, os pacientes é, reportaram é, satisfação semelhante entre os grupos, tanto para perto, intermediário e para longe. Em relação à dependência de óculos, né, a gente viu que teve uma maior dependência de óculos para perto no grupo das edofis. Bom, na conclusão, é, ele queria saber qual desses métodos é, proporcionaria um melhor resultado visual, maior satisfação do paciente, e ele acaba concluindo que todos os três métodos têm é, as suas vantagens e desvantagens, sendo que não teve diferença significativa na visão intermediária é, para os três grupos, o grupo da Mix and Match teve uma visão melhor, é, porém teve uma redução na, nessa gama intermediária né, de distância. E a, a dependência de óculos para perto foi maior também no grupo das edofes, mas a visão intermediária é, na curva de defox foi melhor nesse grupo. E o grupo da trifocal teve a melhor, teve uma boa visão para perto, para intermediária e para longe. E não teve nenhuma diferença em relação à satisfação do paciente. Uh, bom, então alguns pontos que a gente precisa levar em consideração na discussão é a natureza prospectiva do estudo, né? E também que foi o primeiro estudo a comparar simultaneamente esses três tipos de lente, né, incluindo as, as lentes bifocais do mix and match. E alguns pontos que a gente tem que considerar também, que não são tão bons assim, que é o tamanho da amostra, que foi uma amostra pequena. Não foi, não foi randomizado também, podendo causar um viés de, de seleção. Uh, tem que lembrar que nem todos os targets foram para a hemetropia, né? O grupo do olho é, das edofes, o olho não dominante, teve uma micromonovisão. E a análise subjetiva da qualidade de visão também pode não ser é, suficiente, né? Para a gente é, entender o, o quanto que o paciente está vendo desses artefatos visuais. E é isso. Obrigada. Legal. Muito bom. Liang, você está com a mão levantada? Bom, é, Marília, parabéns pela apresentação. Muito interessante esse, esse trabalho. Eu perdi o comecinho. Qual foi o método de seleção da lente ou do paciente? E qual, qual lente colocar em cada olho, Marília? Eu... É, ele fala que foi é, o requisito do paciente, eles levaram em consideração o que, que o paciente queria para perto, para intermediário e para longe, mas ele não, não deixa explícito como que foi feita essa avaliação. É, eu tenho, eu tenho dois, dois comentários, o primeiro é, eu estava vendo a curva de defocos, que no, no, as, as lentes trifocais, é, bem naquele, naquele ponto onde tem o menos um, uma dioptria, que responde a um metro, ele, a, a lente trifocal tendo antes, é, um antes, é isso aí, é, a curva do, a curva do, da trifocal, é, nesse ponto onde tem menos um na abscissa, a, a EDOF tem uma, pela, pela, pela curva de defox, a EDOF tem uma acuidade visual melhor do que a trifocal, e não, e mesmo não sendo mesmo sendo melhor, é, ela não é a, a trifocal, a EDOF não é capaz de sustentar a visão nessa distância, é, é, não consegue se sobressair em relação à trifocal, né? Essa semana eu estava discutindo com o Wallace, é, semana passada eu discutindo com o Wallace sobre as, essas curvas de defocos aí, é interessante porque dependendo da, do método de seleção seja por randomização, principalmente por é, 
a, a, a escolha pela dominância ocular, é, a, essa melhor visão promovida pela EDOF, ela poderia, se, for, se isso fosse se isso fosse usado, né, é, a EDOF colocando no olho dominante, talvez, analisando somente pela curva de defoco, talvez pudesse sustentar um pouco melhor a visão é, nessa distância, né? Mas é muito interessante que o mix and match se fosse é, nessa distância fosse pior do que a do que a trifocal, né? É, eu esperar eu esperaria que, que, que eu esperava que fosse que fosse melhor do que a trifocal sozinha, né? É, 2007 foi fizemos um, um, um estudo comparando a Tecnis multifocal na época era de silicone, era mais quatro, com a Resum. Resum era uma lente multifocal de é, refrativa, né? eram de, não anéis difrativos, eram faixas refrativas. É, a gente comparou um grupo só com Tecnis, Tecnis nos dois olhos, e outro grupo com Mix and Match, Tecnis e, e, e a Resum. E a curva de defocos binocular da, do grupo Tecnis, Tecnis, ela foi, é, do grupo de mix and match, de Tecnis e Resum, foi melhor, binocular, foi melhor do que a Tecnis e Tecnis, nessas distâncias intermediárias. Eu achei interessante também, Liang, eu achei muito bem comentado, é, sei que a, a bifocalidade ainda dá uma, uma visão muito boa para perto, né? Marília, se você for no slide da Tu, por exemplo, de velocidade de leitura. Você consegue colocar aí, Maria? Quer ver? Isso. Você percebe que o grupo de mix and match é esse mais rápido, olha, com letra menor, né? Então, tem um melhor resultado. E isso é um dos motivos que eu acredito que, que, que você tem mais 50... Você tem aproximadamente uma divisão em dois de potência de imagem, né? Que é longe e perto. Então, praticamente, tem quase 50% de, de, de energia para perto. E a EDOF e a trifocal é 23% a 30%. Então, acho que acaba fazendo diferença também nessa qualidade de perto. Então, e, e se pegar o último slide, não se mostra a qualidade geral é, dos pacientes, o score, né? você vai ver que praticamente o grupo bifocal, embora não tenha tido nenhuma diferença estatística, mas o mix and match, incrivelmente, superou todas as fases, né? de o perto, o intermediário e o longe. Né? Se eu estou correto aqui, se eu não estou interpretando errado. E, e para mim isso foi uma grande surpresa nesse trabalho, assim, porque hoje se fala só de edof e trifocal, né? E dá a impressão de quem usa bifocal acaba é, estando desatualizado. E, na verdade, você, tem, você entrega uma excelente visão ainda com essas bifocalidades, né? É verdade, né? A satisfação, às vezes, é um pouco dissociada da curva de defocos, né? Exatamente, exatamente. Né? Interessante isso. Muito o Liang, eu queria fazer um comentário que eu acho importante nisso. Eu não vejo ninguém afastando a possibilidade que esses pacientes tenham microtropia. Você não vê isso declarado nos estudos. E a presença de uma microtropia traria bastante desconforto em algumas situações, por exemplo, o mix e match, né? Então, sempre comento nessas discussões de seleção de lente, é fundamental você isolar a microtropia. Como é que é? Existem várias formas fáceis de fazer isso, mas o que eu, eu sugiro, entre outros testes que você pode fazer, é brincar um pouquinho com a mosca. Ah, o títimos é um teste que é um pouco desprezado, muita gente não valoriza muito, mas os pacientes adultos que não conhecem o teste, eles ficam, assim, bastante encantados pelo teste, né? E você vai ver depois que esses pacientes de mix and match, eles têm, é uma estratégia excelente que a gente usa há muitos anos, mas ah, ela compromete um pouquinho a visão de profundidade, e numa microtropia é um desastre. O resultado é bem ruim. Então, só queria lembrar em relação a isso. 
Outra coisa sobre Você essas já... lentes bifocais, rapidamente, para não atrapalhar a aula do Jorge ali, ó. Uh, essa semana mesmo atendi mais de um paciente que colocou lente trifocal e que veio reclamando que os halos não desapareciam. Uh, e, putz, tô... outra coisa que a gente está sempre comentando. Qual é o problema de você dizer que o halo não vai desaparecer? Comenta com o paciente, porque ele tira essa ansiedade da frente. Ele fica o tempo inteiro esperando que ele vai acordar amanhã e não vai ver mais halo. Pede para ele esquecer o halo. Não dá tanta importância para o halo se ele puder, que o halo não vai desaparecer. A mesma coisa você dizer que o paciente tem floater, que o floater vai desaparecer. Não vai, pode diminuir e tudo, mas tem pacientes que mantêm o floater por muito tempo. Então, acho que aqui tem muito do que você promete que entrega uh, e depois você ainda fica justificando o que não entregou. Então, acho que isso é importante no sucesso desse tipo de cirurgia. É, você já viu uma, alguma, alguma, alguma descompensação por necotropia em mix and match? Porque assim, eu já vi eu na, na monovisão... Eu mesmo, é maior, eu né? mesmo tive. Eu não vi, eu experimentei porque eu tenho a microtropia e fiquei estrábico de ah. fazer monovisão com lente de contato. Então, eu não preciso citar ninguém, eu cito eu mesmo. Hoje eu tenho que usar 10 uh, prismas de optrias no óculos para não ter visão dupla. Uh, eu tenho a médica que trabalha conosco, estrabóloga, que o Tomás acabou de operar, porque ela fez uma monovisão com o Exmer, e descompensou o estrabismo, começou a ver duplo, e precisou operar um ET. Então, a gente vê bastante isso, uh, Fred. Se quiser, eu mostro o óculos que agora não. eu tenho que usar, por conta desse não, não negócio não. de embaçar um olho e não fazer uma seleção adequada de Concordo. a capacidade que as pessoas têm de fundir imagem. Tem que ter isso na sua ficha. É uma avaliação importante. Porque se você for, entre aspas, um borderline aí, uma diferença de menos um vai te atrapalhar bem o dia a dia. Acho que, o, o Mauro, acho que o, o que o Fred está falando é que a, a monovisão dá muito mais essa alteração do que o mix match que tem as duas visões para longe e para perto. É mix match de multifocal. E é diferente de fazer uma monovisão híbrida, por exemplo. Você colocaria uma multifocal de um lado e uma, uma monofocal do outro. Talvez até tivesse menos uh, alteração de estrabismo uh, do que a monovisão, não? Né? Você pode descompensar do mesmo jeito. É difícil analisar isso, mas as imagens serão diferentes, recebidas por cada olho. Esse eu acho que é um problema que deve ser considerado no pré-operador. No mínimo, identifica se seu paciente é microtrópico ou não. Isso já é, é uma é grande coisa que você faz. Bom, pessoal, vamos passar aqui. Eu vou trocar o idioma agora, tá? Uh, so, good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest today. Uh, we will be, we had the honor to have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Jorge Alió uh, with us, and also Dr. Luis Brenner, who is our uh, friend and uh, is once more uh, able to participate with us. So, I'll ask, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Alio, uh, would you like to uh, start with your presentation? Anytime. Happy to do it. Uh, is Dr. Brenner there? Yes, Dr. Brenner is here as well. Yeah, I'm okay. here, Very good. Dr. Alio. Hi, hello, no how are you? Well, thank you for this invitation. I, I don't speak Portuguese, but neither Portuguese, you know, but I very happy with my colleagues. I always have a very nice time with my colleagues there, and I, I hope in the future we'll, we'll establish that connection soon, right? So thank yes. you for And to start, we are going to talk about something that I have understood that you have been dealing with along this day, which are the new, new premium presbyopia correcting lenses. So this is the topic. I want to thank uh, Dr. Brenner and, and all the, the organization of this course, of this invitation. And again, I feel very happy. I have many friends in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, especially a city I have visited several times. And Dr. Brenner, as you know, is my colleague and ex-fellow, and we have a deep friendship from many, many years. So thank you, Luis, for being 
in making this possible. I, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to talk to you about premium intraocular lenses, and I have to tell you that I have a, a, a consultant of most of these companies. So this information, even that I will give from independent basis, indeed, I have quite a lot of uh, interest with the industry about this. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you on independent basis, providing my own data and my own opinions about them. Okay. So first of all, this has been one topic that has been very emerging the last. 10 years, but especially on the last uh, five years, have been increasing a lot uh, because the basis demands. Basis are really in the wish to be in the expected independent for far and near. And uh, obviously for far has been accomplished already, but for near, many uh, lenses have been tried successfully or unsuccessfully to accomplish this endeavor. And the topic of this presentation is to show to you how is the, 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 the newest information and, the, and my concept about the use of these uh, lenses. <clears throat> Today, we have different trends in multifocal lenses. First, first, remember, we have two types of technology in multifocals, which can be refractive and diffractive. Then we have the, the, the new series of lenses that since about two years have been emerging, what, is, what they are called extended depth of field. Then we have add-ons to the fake or fake multifocal lenses. They are an extensive topic that I will not, not address today, but there is multifocality that can be added on top of a previous monofocal lens. And indeed, this is a topic that can be very interesting, especially in the future. Finally, we have accommodative intraocular lenses. Well, thank you. Let, let me tell you that I work in Alicante, Spain, and this is the, our institute. And Dr. Brenner has been my colleague uh, at almost three years here, the companies. Topic of premium presbyopic lenses. I was talking about the, the different ways in which we can have these premium lenses today, multifocal, extended of field, add on or accommodative lenses. And I was uh, talking about this, you know, the, that we have now uh, this, this, uh, this uh, huge topic that in my practice at least corresponds to about 70% of my practice. So seven out of 10 lenses that I use are premium areas. So uh, let's start with this, uh, this type of, of technology. We have diffractive, refractive, and ELOV lenses. The, the three of them have been uh, evolving, and we have uh, innovations in these three areas, and especially in the last one, which has been quite a, a melting pot and with a lot of uh, misinformation that I will try to clarify. So let me start now with the ELOV lenses, as far as this is a topic that is probably the hottest of all. Okay, pure, what is an ELOV lens? First of all, the ELOV lenses, just in the street concept, are those that manipulate the spherical aberration in a way that that creates an extended longitudinal plate uh, in terms of the image focus. That means that instead of a, a spot, we get a line, and this line obviously corresponds to the, to the distribution of energy along the, the visual axis. Mm -hmm. This elongated focus uh, has only one image, so theoretically, they don't have overlapping of images like in multifocal lenses, but they are dividing the energy along a long focus, the longest, the more the division, and the, 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 the trade-off of this is that you decrease the quality of radial image. So whatever ELOV lens you use, the more the ELOV principle, the more is the, 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 the degradation of the quality of radial image because of the division of light. Very important, but obviously you don't have uh, different images overlapping and halos are not expected in these lenses. The other lenses are based in a different type of, of model, which are, is the pinhole effect. And the pinhole effect can achieve uh, also the ELOV in a completely different way. And finally, remember that we have today, and, and we're going to talk about this, innovate, innovative optical profiles that are appearing with a new type of ELOV lenses. So, so far, ELOV have been basically manipulating the, the spherical aberration, but uh, we have the pinhole, but now we have other technologies that are uh, very promising, and I will talk about them uh, today as well. So uh, one thing that I want you to remember is that those lenses are for intermediate vision. This is a statement of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and you can find this in the American Academy of Ophthalmology reports, and in the preferred path patterns. Those lenses are for intermediate vision. So when we are talking about the dove, they cannot stand near vision. Most of them, or very few of them, can get uh, this just if they use hybrid technology. So this is important. It of are not for near vision. It of are for intermediate vision. And this is why I published this editorial about one year ago in, in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, Journal of Ophthalmology, in which I was uh, bringing the, 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 the 
to clarify the concept of IROF, because many lenses that are really multifocal are being traded as IROF. Commercial bias is huge, and there's a tremendous confusion in the in the minds of many surgeons about what they are using, what is an IROF, and what is a multifocal. So read this uh, editorial. You will have, in my opinion, a lot of information about what is the, the problem with IROF. And let me put you some, some example, examples. I told you that we have a limit to extend the depth of focus. And this limit, when it's overpassed, for instance, if we want to, to, to get near vision, not only intermediate, then we have model, uh, different lenses that try to accomplish. This is one example, the WIOL uh, from the uh, from Czech Republic, in which a, a, a hyperbolic profile uh, was implanted in the gastro bag, uh, aiming to increase three diopters the, the depth of focus. The results were, were reported in many meetings as very good, but finally, in, in October 2018, the company canceled the activities because bankruptcy. These lenses were not offering what they were promising, and many of the reports that were on these lenses were fake news. A lot of fake news have been happening with it of lenses. Other lens is this one, the mini one. I don't know if you have this in your country, in Brazil, but this lens has a bispherical profile and tries to accomplish near vision just by changing the spherical aberration in two areas. The real thing is that this hand, this lens in my hands has provided bad quality of vision for far, bad quality of vision for near, and has been the subject of 30% displantation rate in my hands. So this is another lens that has revealed to be totally fake news. And so uh, if you want to target near, near vision with, with a, a elongated depth of focus, you cannot use only spherical aberration. This is the concept. Spherical aberration can be uh, manipulated to get about one diopter maximum, 1.5 maximum. This is why uh, other lenses have appeared. This is the pinhole principle in which uh, uh, the IC8, for instance, another one that has been developed by Walter Nose in, in Brazil, uh, reduces the, 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 the light through a pinhole principle that is from, from 1.36 to one millimeter. Indeed, these lenses can work. We know very well the pinhole principle, but all these lenses, when reducing the to the pinhole principle, the entrance of light will decrease the, the, the peripheral visual field. And remember, peripheral visual field is peripheral. It's not the 30 degrees that we usually measure with the visual field test, and this is normal in these lenses. If you extend the visual field to 60 degrees analysis, you will see that these patients are working like in, 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 in retinitis pigmentosa cases with a loss of peripheral vision. This is why these lenses are with this type of, of limitation, and indeed you should know that. This is the, the extra focus. This is one that has been created also with the same principle. They have been uh, implanted in, in Brazil. And as you know, this is the same principle, even smaller, and this can be implanted in the sulcus while the other lens was implanted in the casual back. So the casual back is a stable structure. Remember the sulcus is an asymmetrical structure, and I feel I find it difficult to center this lens with one millimeter in the visual axis. So uh, de dealing with IROF lenses, remember that we are playing a trade-off between quality of vision and depth of field. The better the depth of field, the, the more extended, the less the quality of vision. And the more the optical aberrations, the less the quality of vision as well. If you put a pin, use a pinhole principle, you decrease the, the preference of field, whatever they say they do, because I have the evidence. And then we shall talk about new technologies later on that can, uh, uh, in my opinion, make a revival of the IDOF concept, which is quite, at this moment, in stagnation, using a different technologies. So this is why, as far as the limitations of IDOF, why many of these IDOF lenses are really not IDOF lenses. They are multifocal with some IDOF principle. These lenses are called hybrid lenses, and these hybrid lenses are indeed working as multifocals with a, with a low near vision art. This that is trying to be compensated with an IDOF principle. Problem is that the law principle, when you implant a lens with a given spherical aberration, you have to consider which is the spherical aberration of the cornea, because uh, the spherical aberration of the cornea can be or not adequately compensated by this lens. So this is why IDOF, if it is by definition variable, either in lenses that are just purely IDOF or in lenses that are multifocal IDOF. This is why multifocal IDOF lenses sometimes have not been successful in near vision. And, uh, the most popular has been the Technis Symphony that has been uh, um, uh, created 
with the, as a multifocal, what the linear vision had, and a love principle that compensates for about 0.75 hertz. This is not a purely dot depth, it's a hybrid lens, and the, the, the synchrony, which is another lens that has appeared, is, um, is using more near vision power because this lens failed in near vision and, uh, the, and, uh, and using either principle be much more successful. Other type of example <coughs> about uh, lenses that have been um, announced as either of and are not is the Panoptis. Panoptis is a low near vision power multifocal diffractive lens. And this is all, you know, this lens is good for far vision, good for intermediate vision, but very limited for near vision because near vision usually is not accomplished properly in many places. In my hands, this lens is followed by 25% near vision uh, use of glasses by my patients, the reason why I am not using it that frequently either. Then you have other lenses that are using another type of technology, which is the refractive technology. Refractive technologies are having a re-emerging now, you will see it now, and the most typical and most well known is the Lentis family. The Lentis family is now recreated with a new type of material, which I'll see this immediately. And with this, you have a, 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 a progressive transition in the focus, which is in real basis and, uh, and, and in, um, um, elongated focus based on in the increase in power. This increase in power follows the, the very focal model of optics and is successful. The M plus is a, is a type of lens that in the X, uh, use, uh, uses a plus near vision art of three and a peripheral asphericity that is uh, making this space extremely accurate for near, but with distortion for far. And this is uh, the apparatial asphericity technology, what is, called, what is another example of creating a mixed hybrid lens with, with a refractive technology and an ear of principle. Now, what other refractive lenses are now in the market, multifocal and ear of? These are the, the two that are more relevant now. One, those that are based on new optical profiles with which the most relevant one, in my opinion, is the precision uh, from OPTEC and new materials, which is the Acunex value. Let me talk to you briefly about them. This lens is the precision from OPTEC. OPTEC is a company that has created a sectorial multifocal lens in which different type of facilitated optics create near and, in, and far vision uh, uh, images in an alternative way. This complex uh, optics uh, that you can see in the image <clears throat> is people independent and creates this type of multiple focuses in the in the retina that makes this a uh, multifocal lens, which is particularly brilliant for near vision at the cost of minimal halos and glare. They have this photopsia, this photopsia is a problem, but halos and glare has been very much minimized by this lens. And this is the profile. This lens is one of the, in my opinion, innovations. It's provided in toric uh, models as well. And the advantage is that you can get from one to, to 35 diodes. So you cover all the spectrum of indications from high myops to, to high hyperops with this lens, which is very much well. And this is a, the innovation from Oculentis. Oculentis has created a new company called Teleon. And Teleon has used a new hydrophobic uh, material. This new hydrophobic material using not a plate haptic uh, model, but a silhouette model has created a new, uh, uh, this new lens, which is called the Vario, that is supplied with plus 1.5 <coughs> and plus three diodes. So it's the, the, it uses the optics of the uh, Oculentis family with the advantage of a new material that has a high initial refraction and a, a very uh, adequate AV factor and as felicity that, that is added to the to the all the edges of this lens. This lens is indeed an innovation in refractive lenses. But now the major innovation, the most important, has appeared with the new what I call monofocal plus lenses. Well, monofocal plus lenses are lenses that manipulate the light, created a, 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 a focus at intermediate distance and to some extent even for near. And they, they are not using as felicity as as felicity change as a as a principle. They are not changing they're not, uh, excuse me, introducing an, any type of uh, power add in terms of multifocality, but they work in a different way. It's still not easy to understand because the companies are not clear about what they do. And I will talk to you about this. This is indeed a real innovation. The, problem, the, the advantage of these lenses is that they don't have a decrease in contrast sensitivity because they don't elongate the focus in the way that they use with us with uh, aberrations and they don't have multifocality. So they should not have halos and glare because there is no superimposition of images. 
there should not be a decrease in the quality of radiation. It's a very important issue because most of the neuroadaptation problems comes because of the inadequate quality of retinal image that leads to poor contact sensitivity. And no neuroadaptation is required. These new monofocal plus lenses, I'm going to talk to you about this. They are an innovation and it seems to be extremely attractive. <coughs> the, the first that appeared in the market is the Technics Enhance from Johnson & Johnson. Offers a biconvex continuous and higher order sensitivity at the surface, has a central increase in power in the first, in the, in the, in the one millimeter of the center of the lens and uh, has uh, a pupil dependency in part and indeed is a lens that looks and behaves as a monofocal. But the truth is that this lens being a monofocal has no neural adaptation, has no halos, no glare, has an intermediate vision of, uh, accomplishment, which is good, and in some patients even near vision with adequate pupil uh, motility. We have performed a study that is sent for publication at this moment in which we have used all the normal parameters that we investigate to study the quality of retinal image and the performance of the patient in terms of the focus score and contestative function. And look at the, our data. Our data first offer extremely accurate values for far vision. Uh, we, we had very uh, good calculation uh, uh, approach and the patients ended in more or less what we wanted. The uncorrected for this visual acuity was very good, and the uncorrected visual acuity was very much improved. It's not fantastic, but it's good. It's good enough to be spectacularly independent if you read up to J3. More than J3, it doesn't offer, you know? And the corrected for uh, the, the, the art we did, that we had to, to do in these cases was 1.6 diodes versus almost three diodes in the control. So this is a, con a case control study in which we investigate the performance of the eye hands with very favorable outcomes for intermediate and improved near vision as well. This is a, indeed something that was performed at no cost or contraceptivity as I'm going to show to you. This is a publication that we have, and this is the paper that you can read in, in GRS that we have been publishing. This is the focus curve. As you see, is the focus curve of a it, it lens. Is a in very good intermediate and near vision. You need a, a, an input of about one to 1.5 diopters to make the patients DA1. But DA3 is accomplished in most of the cases. The most important finding of our study is the one that you can see down, down in this image, which is the PSF. The PSF is a point. I'm going to show to you immediately how the PSF is analyzed uh, by us. Yeah, as, a, as, a, as a way to, uh, to investigate the quality of retinal image and the quality of retinal image by convolution of this very case, this is a case of one patient, as you see, is excellent. You have in the graphic of the, of the intermediate, you have the ETDR chart, the visual simulation offers a clear, pristine, bright uh, quality of vision, but not at the cost of, of an increase in aberrations. Look at the mean uh, ocular. Target or the aberration was 0.31, which is remarkably low, is normal. So we don't have more aberrations. We have good quality radial limits, good intermediate vision, near vision improved. This lens works very well. Far vision is excellent. This is the focus score as well. Again, I, I, you can see here that mean on where the near vision acuity was 0.21. That means many patients required to read small prints glasses and the, and the near vision arc was 1.5. So in other words, you gain with this lens 1.5 diopters for sure. And in some cases, because of the particular behavior of the people with the optic design of this lens, near vision is quite acceptable as well. Again, the quality of retinal image is outstanding. And look here that the shrill ratio is 0.5, which is one of the maximums you can get with any monofocal lens. So this lens is a monofocal lens with intermediate vision and no photo phenomena. This is the conclusion. So this is a lens that I'm using as a monofocal lens. If I have to choose a monofocal, I choose this lens. And this lens offers to me the advantage of intermediate vision. Some patients are very happy with near vision. I never promise that, but they can. And indeed, it's a major uh, accomplishment for those of you that don't want to run into troubles of this photopsia and want to implant premium lenses in these cases. But there's another lens as an example, which is the Vivid. Made this from Alcon, and the Alcon has created a lens that looks like a monofocal. But if you are careful and under the microscope, you can see this a small central area, which is a plateau. It's a kind of one millimeter plateau in which the lens is elevating and creating a wavefront change. Difficult to explain to you how they do that. I have no clear information. I have to tell you that many times I have been discussing this with the company. The information they release is not the real one. 
Alcon is a good company, but they want to keep the secret of this lens. And the real thing is that, that they, what they accomplish <coughs> is the is a, a behavior of the center of the lens, which is working with the pupil as well. And that elongates the focus. But is this elongation is not related to a change in the aberrations of the patient, is not related to a multifocality. So it's a completely new concept of multifocality. What is my, my opinion about this lens? Is very good. I don't have, I have not finished the study yet, so I cannot provide to you as with the enhanced data. But I have to tell these patients are remarkably good. Far vision is excellent. Intermediate vision, excellent. Near vision, very good. It's not like a multifocal, but they are most of them spectacle independent. No halos, no glare, no photophenomena. This lens deserves attention. Probably it's a new generation of lenses that will be in the future changing the, 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 the availability of, the, of lenses uh, that we have in a way that we can use a much more freely and much less exposed to complications. So uh, remember, it all lenses that the, we have today based on operations provides an intermediate vision improvement, never near vision. They degrade the quality of reality elements and they can lead to many troubles, especially those like mini well or the well from IOL that have to increase a lot the spherical aberration and as a consequence, decreasing a lot the quality of reality elements. Remember, some fake news are happening around. Acromatization, for instance, has been offered as a, as a dentist in, this, in the symphony lens and uh, 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 if it is expected to be because of chromatization. It's not true. Chromatization works in a totally different way, can be accomplished in many ways, and is not improving their vision at all. And so it, it lenses should be uh, today called as pure of those that are not adding multifocality, some, uh, those that are with some multifocality of the symphony and the panotis and others are really hybrid lenses, and the monofocal plus lenses are an emerging interesting option that deserves attention, and I'm sure that they will uh, uh, give a lot of uh, important impact in the, in the market because of the, of the quality that I observe in the results. Now, let me talk to you about other innovations because we have lenses that probably are not listed in this talk, but we need to evaluate the new perspective lens. When you have a new lens, how, how do you know that it's good for your patients? You have to request to the companies this uh, two issues. One, optical quality and retinal optical quality. Retinal quality is the essential tool because the better is the retinal image quality, the better and faster will be nerve adaptation. And the visual performance is not only neuroprocessing, as far as cortical perception and the closer these lenses will offer the, the focus curve to what is physiological, the easier will be the, uh, the, the way to nerve adapt. Second, what we, we need to define success. You want to implant a lens and you need to know, is the lens going to be successful? Let me tell you what is successful for me. For me, successful, success is 2020 for far. I don't renounce to any line of, of far vision because patients with poor near far vision are much more prone to neural adaptation failure and to creating problems in your office. Second, I want intermediate vision, but I don't sacrifice near vision. So for me, intermediate and near vision should be about J2 in both cases. So otherwise, I'm, I'm not happy because yeah, at least in Spain, our patients want to read. And if you have a patient only with intermediate vision, I, the, the patient will say to you, I cannot read the, 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 a bill in a restaurant, cannot really uh, see uh, the, 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 well, the, the many information that we have on the cell phone, etc. These patients have to be number one priority, far, good for far, but second should be about J2 for near and intermediate. This is my definition of success. And in this way, we have an inspector independent patient in all circumstances. So the neural adaptation is uh, the second term. So you define success, and now how do you know that the patient is, is going to be so, uh, happy? You have to evaluate by the focus score and using the low mesopic contrast sensitivity. The, the focus score is very important, and low mesopic contrast sensitivity will give to you a, a translation of what is the quality of retina image. The, the, uh, this is the, the, the focus score at the left of a patient of 30 years of age, and you have at the right a normal uh, subject of 45. 45 is a presbyopic age. These patients are already with in the promise in near vision. You have to get something in between because if you have a focus curve that is less good the, of the, than the one of a 45 years old, the patient will have near vision glasses and will not be happy. But if the, you get a plateau, 
this patient will uh, will of uh, get a, a quality of red animus that is uh, and the focus code that is almost physiological and the rotation will be very good. So those uh, the, the focus scores that are similar to a normal the focus code of 30 years old, something not yet accomplished, or similar to a 45 and in between are the happy patients based on the focus score. And look here the variability of the focus scores that you have. This is a paper that is taken from Breyer. And you see that the focus curve and the first one that you have in gray is a monofocal lens, have a diversity. Those that are a plateau would be ideal. Those that are bifocal will be followed by problems of neural adaptation. Some of them that are with, with too low profile in near vision will make the basis to use near vision glasses, not happy as well. And this is still happening with most of the top lenses. They don't provide near vision. And now the quality of radio limits is essential in understanding uh, the following, which is the contrast sensitivity. We, we have a method based on the use of pyramidal aberrometry, uh, cancelling all the second order aberrations to know how high is the quality of radio limits in different lenses. And look here, we have in this image a monofocal lens, very well known, which is the SA60. It's a spherical lens, it's not a spherical, and the swell ratio is 0.53. It's a paper submitted for publication. Look here at the middle, the, the one of the LISA tree. LISA tree has a quality of red and limits that is uh, the swell ratio of 0.46. That means less than the, than the monofocal and with some halo, but this halo is remarkably small. The convolution image is good, even that is not as good as the one from the monofocal lens. But now look at the Oculentis MF30, which is a refractive lens with a near vision of plus three. Indeed, you have a swell ratio that is 0.22, so the quality of the image is degraded to half of the one that should be in a monofocal lens. And as a consequence, you have this type of convoluted image. These patients will have far and near vision, but some of them, if they are hypercritical, will see uh, halos, and definitely you will not get a quality of the image, which is the one of monofocal. So monofocal is the champion, is the, is the model to beat. And let me see, show to you other lenses how do they behave. This is the monofocal versus one of the fake news that have appeared in the in the last years, which is the mini well. A mini well has an awful uh, image quality. Look here, compared with the monofocal, the swell ratio is 0 0.09 versus 0 0.5. So it's, it's a very bad lens in terms of quality of image. This justifies why many of my patients were not happy and why I had an expansion rate of 30% when I was using this lens. So be sure that this parameter, quality of red elements, is offered to you because with this, you will disqualify many lenses to be using the practice. This is the same image that I, that I showed to you at the beginning. See, again, just to compare the monofocal, the trifocal, and the oculentis, how they are different compared with the mini well is clearly a much worse lens. Now, this is uh, just the, the, to offer to you again, the a purely EDOF lens, over supplied in terms of spherical aberration and as a consequence, increasing the, the depth of focus, but at the, at the cost of decreasing image quality. Even that they increase the depth, of, the, the depth of focus, they cannot accomplish near vision because the light is so much dispersed that there is no energy for near vision and these patients use near vision glasses always. This is, an, uh, again, the comparison, but now with ELISA. Look, uh, the monofocal, the, the, the trifocal uh, size lens, uh, the LISA, and, the, and this it all lens, the mini well. There is not, no way to make a, 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 any doubt that the quality of the one of the mini well is far less than the others. And now look at the eye hands. The eye hands has a, a pinpoint uh, a quality of radio limits. Look that the swell ratio is 0.5, similar, identical, let's say, to the monofocal SA30, and the visual simulation offers an outstanding. Lens. Uh, the refractive error diagram is very interesting. Doesn't offer any change in power in this lens. So what the company says is true. They are not increasing the power of the lens. How they create this intermediate vision effect with such a remarkable good vision for far and such a remarkable quality of the lens is a mystery that will be explained by us by Johnson and Johnson. One of these. Cases. Now let me talk to you about the oh, the second parameter. The first is the, the, the focus curve. The second is. Uh, the low mesopic contrastivity. Low mesopic contrastivity is the critical one in multifocal lenses. Don't measure photopic, don't measure scot scotopic. 
What matters is the loan may show up because the patients are unhappy when they cannot read in the restaurant, when they cannot read uh, on the, when they are on the, on the bed, when we are traveling in an aircraft with light, that is not enough to, to make the visa. This is the, the low measure because of the, the, of the uh, Lisa tree. <clears throat> and this is the fine vision. This is the fine vision, a very good lens, but look how quantity is significantly lower than the Lisa tree. This is again how different diffractive models create different impact contact sensitivity. Now look at the restore plus, uh, plus three, ha, is, uh, has even less conductivity than the fine vision. Now look at the M, M plus, M plus has a very good uh, uh, function in the high circuit sport degree spatial frequencies, but in between has not as good as the LISA. So the LISA is a winner of these lenses. And now this is another lens, which is the monofocal that is the champion. So the champion definitely is the one that, that wins. If we have uh, to compare the monofocal with the others, we didn't find statistically significant differences with ELISA. We didn't find statistically significant differences with the opulent plus three, but definitely the cores are less good than in the monofocal in both of them. You can read this paper in the opinion you now. Tomorrow. Now let me explore an area of presbyopia lenses that is very attractive and innovative, which is the correction of presbyopia with fake multifocal lenses. We opened this, this, this uh, area of a study in 2005 with a first publication made ever on this topic in ophthalmology. This paper from us offered the first multifocal lens to be implanted in the eye with the purpose of corrective presbyopia. We used the platform of an angle supported lens, and the optics was of the resume. That lens was manufactured by uh, Allergan, and at the moment was very successful. These lenses happened to be successful, but the problems were related to the haptic profile because angle supported lenses, as you know, in the long term offers many problems. This is why recently some companies have been focusing in uh, posterior chamber lenses. So chamber lenses like this, which is the Presby IPCL, offers a diffractive profile that implanted in uh, behind the iris can offer the advantage of correct Presby. It's supply in powers from one to three on top on the any refraction that is provided. And this lens can be implanted as an acrylic material on the sulcus like the ICL. This is the pattern of this lens. This lens has no written paper so far. We have been using this lens with some benefits, as you will see now. This is the quality of radio elements of the patient. As you see, the diffractive model and the, the diffractive profile is clear in the midst of the, uh, of the upper side of the slide. Look at the quality of radio elements, which is quite acceptable to good. In the uh, and it's not a pinpoint, but it's good. The PSF was acceptable to good, and the convolution image offers to us that the patient has quite good vision for far and good vision for near. What it was the problem of the lenses? This problem of the lenses was that explantation happened to be frequent because of cataract induction. When we open an eye in a presbyopic age, do we promote cataragenesis in many patients? So this is the problem. It's not the lens, it's not the material, it's that we open the eye. This problem didn't happen that much to us with the angle supported models, but happened a lot in the posterior chamber models. And I think that this will happen with the model of the ICF that is being under investigation because manipulating the posterior chamber and, and in that way being near the crystalline lens is probably harmful for the lens and promotes cataracts in a much more frequent way. So I would like to, to finish this talk with some uh, important thing, which is about accommodation. accommodation. <clears throat> Can we replace accommodation with an intraocular lens? Can we uh, re replicate this com complex mechanism that, uh, that makes related to shared body action to focus objects for near? This is something that let me explain to you how is the condition of this object. Okay, so the, we have different lenses in the past. And we have to agree that all of them were extremely discouraging us to use them. They were fake news. Many of them were, were using presentations, even from distinguished uh, doctors, claiming for the effectivity. The real thing is none of them really work. And I have here the list of the, of the lenses that were more frequently implanted from the crystal lens to the synchrony, the human optics, and other lenses that were not working at all. And this is one problem. So can we get a new generation of augmented lenses? Uh, well, probably yes. Please read this, uh, this paper of me and my, and my group in I Am Vision. This is just a, a summary of everything that is uh, published until 2017 about accommodated lenses. Nothing new is after this paper, even that is already three years old. And the problem of the lenses is to understand when to place the lens. 
accommodative lenses, uh, theoretically and, and intuitively, should be implanted in casual back. But you will see that this has some problems. And other option is to implant in the sulcus. And we have uh, made a study in which we implanted a, 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 a device that can, could measure the, the, the vectors forces that happens inside the casual back in, a, in a, or when implanted inside outside the casual back in the in the sulcus of different profiles that we have used. In other words, we created a model, a primitive model, in which we investigated how are the forces inside the casual back or outside the casual back. We implant this measuring device and to see whether the casual back is the place or not. Is a paper that was published in GRS in 2015, and we used this primate model, the one, one monkey that is from Colombia, is very is identical in terms of accommodation and eye to the human being. And this uh, primate was the one that we used for our investigation. We discovered that the casual bag is not a place to implant the lens. Uh, the, uh, the measuring device was unable to measure any force in the, in the, when implanted the casual bag after six months, well, after one year, these monkeys were alive one year, still they were measuring forces in the zoo. So the casual bag is not the place. And why? First thing, that, what is the casual bag? Casual bag is a basal membrane of the less epithelium. Once the casual bag is empty, there are no functions, anatomical reasons for it to exist. Simply talking, suffers a mummification process. So fibrosis is, is impossible to avoid and atrophy as well. So the casual bag, by definition, cannot function in the long term when it's emptied, and this is what we measure, and this is what qualify our findings in this uh, functional study that we did in the monkey. So we have elected since many years the sulcus to be the place for a, for a accommodative lens. This is how we participated in the, in the design of the luminal lens. The luminal lens is a, is a dual lens in which we use two optics with the same haptic are aiming to improve near vision related to ciliary bodies. The way in which the lumina works is based on the Albert principle, in which two varifocal surfaces, when one is sliding into the other, creates a continuous change in the optical pole of the eye. This is real accommodation, and the purpose of this study was to demonstrate that this technique was true. This is the surgery. Uh, you will see how this lens, which probably is, is, is new for many of you, is implanted. The lens is implanted in the, in the same way like any other lens. We use the positive meridian for the incision in order to compensate any astigmatism that, that could happen in the patient. We use microincisional cartridge solid through incisions of one millimeter. And then we are, once that we finish the, by manual way, this already to implant the lens. We need to collapse the casual back. So this elastic is implanted in the sulcus, collapsing the anterior uh, casual back onto the posterior casual back, creating this way space in the sulcus to implant the lens. This is how we open 2.75 millimeters the incision in order to implant the lens with the cartridge. The lens needs three millimeters. This is the power. The lens is implanted in the vertical meridian and is customized in terms of the size for every one of the patients. Then this is the profile of the lens has a mark in order to know that we are not implanting it uh, upside down. And now we take the lens to, for, to the cartridge for, uh, because uh, is the eye is ready for the implantation. The haptics are designed in a way that the sulcus they will get the forces for the ciliary body sulcus. And now I am planting the lens. The lens is implanted in the sulcus. Remember the casual bag is, is collapsed. With the second hand, I am forcing the entrance of the trial haptic in the sulcus. And once that uh, both the distal haptic and the trial haptic is in the sulcus, we leave the case, we test that we see the casuaresis uh, behind the lens. And now we are going to empty the lens and the eye from the viscoelastic. The viscoelastic should be clean from uh, the anterior chamber, also from behind the lens and in between the lens. This is how I am using by this by manual approach in order to clean the lens. And once the viscoelastic is, is, is uh, eliminated, then the operation is over. What I'm going to show to you can be read in this paper of American Journal of Ophthalmology and in a later one that we publish in GRS, Journal of Active Surgery. So we, we have used objective and subjective methods to analyze the outcomes of this lens. This is the one simulate, the, the one analyzer. One is the wavefront analyzer. A wavefront analyzer analyzes the change in the, in the wavefront of the eye in terms of the optic power according to distance. So you're moving the target from far away to near, and according to near, they, you have different activities in the change of power. This is how they, they implanted this with this uh, patient that was implanted in one eye and in the other eye. This the, uh, look in the left, 
that you have effect on near vision there is and 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 the stimulus that increases the power of the lens according to distance while it's not happening in the monofocal so this is truly accommodation is related the, the power with the distance in this is the focus core that uh, as you see is offering to you what is about a patient in the 40 40 years of age remember what i told you before should be no more than 45. these patients had a near vision that was between 1.6 to three diopters. Three diopters was not accomplished, but only in few cases, but from 1.6 to 2, many patients accomplished this. So variability existed. Variability is an is a, is a issue that you have to remember that will happen in any physiological function. We are not with the same strength, we are not with the same capabilities, and this happens with accommodation as well. And we could discover that different profiles happen in different patients from plateaus, peaks and plateaus, and these different ones always provide the evidence of intermediate vision good, near vision quite good, sometimes excellent. This is a patient satisfaction with the lens, excellent, really very, very good. And this is the, the, the one remarkable finding because we were at that moment, remember we implanted the lens in the in the sulcus, that probably the casual back could be fibrotic and could lead to diagnosis casualotomy frequently. It's true we have diag uh, the patients in about 25 to 27% of the cases, but when doing diagnostic astrotomy, we increase the power of the of the near vision. That means that the patient that the that the eye is when the pressure of, of, of the tension of the posterior capsule is released, is increasing the effectiveness of the lens. Because you see here that in blue is the, the, the focus curve before the yard laser and in red the, the, as the far, far after the yard casualotomy. Look that the far vision has been improved, obviously, patient had a PCO. Look at that the intermediate vision has improved, obviously, patient had a PCO. But look how near vision has increased. And so near vision is improved with the early casualotomy, a remarkable finding. This is the one outcome uh, to the, that, that was obtained in, in the controls. With the, the control was with the SA60 from Alcon to the lens. And you see that in all distances, we had a significant difference with the monofocal. This is the focus curve uh, comparing the, the, the luminal lens with the monofocal. Look that we have excellent near intermediate vision, far intermediate vision, and quite good near vision as well. Were all the patients pedigree independent? The answer is no. Some of them still use glasses of our 1 to 1.5 diopters because of the variability. This variability has been very much reduced now. And the last set of, of patients that we have operated, believe me, I, I cannot remember one using near vision glasses. The good thing is that contraceptive function is, is normal. So these patients that have a monofocal lens, they don't lose contraceptivity in any frequency, especially in mesopic. And this is a very interesting study that we did, published in Journal of Fact Disorder, in which we compare patients with less than 30 years in terms of accommodation, monofocal implanted lenses, and the lumina. And we have measured the three of them with the WOM analyzer, with the wavefront analyzer. Look that the normal person has obvious accommodation, less than 30 years. Look at the right, we have accommodation, but you see that it's much more dispersed than the young person. So this is what reflects the variability that you have to expect with multifocal lenses, excuse me, with accommodative lenses, because accommodation is a function that can be variable. And indeed, both were totally different to the focal lens. So this is objective information about the use of, a, of a successful use of accommodative lenses uh, related to the near restoration near vision. Again, look at the differences, uh, and, and this is important when the, when the PC, when we have a disruption in the posterior capsule during surgery, there's a patient in which we had in one eye a monofocal, and in the second eye, we had a castral back disruption. Okay? We, we, we have problems during the surgery. Still, the patient has accommodation. So this lens, as far as you respect, and is respected, the anterior castral ring can be implanted in the sucus in the presence of vitreous loss successfully. Obviously, this offers a tremendous opportunity to this species. And this is the, the, the focus curve of the contralateral eye of the same patient with a monofocal lens and the one with casual break offering better intermediate vision. So to finish uh, this uh, accommodative lenses, we have the evidence now that the Aculis Lumina is accommodating, is a successful lens, accommodation can be restored, the near vision outcomes are very good, even that they are not 
uh, to, uh, constant, they can be variable, but these spaces are spectacularly independent. Most of the cases, intervening vision is always good, and the problem is that we cannot guarantee near vision performance is spectacularly independent because about one third of them uses glasses. The posterior casual is not necessary for this lens as far as you can use it even with vitreous loss. And the ones that the aggressive casual has been performed, there is no negative impact, rather positive impact in the performance of the lens. And this is a tremendous uh, gain for the future. This study is, is going to start December the 5th in Colombia, in a multicentrical study that is already uh, in progress here in Spain. And you will uh, have very soon uh, a Source from this multi, this multi focal place, uh, the, the multifocal study, <coughs> excuse me, the multinational study performed in a, in a different places in order to understand what is happening with this. So, to close this presentation, remember multifocality and EDOF are not physiological. We are working with technologies, EDOF and multifocal, that are not what happens to be normal in the human being. Multifocal optics will require always narrow adaptation. The more the, diff, the, diff, the more different is the, the focus score, the normal one of the of the of previously epic patient, normal patient, the more the neurotation we need. The less the, the, the mesopic positivity, the less the, the quality of the visual uh, performance and the less patient satisfaction. And quality of radial image is related to contactivity and is measurable today. Once that the accommodative lenses that, as you see, are a real promise appear, multifocus will not be any longer successful. Once that we have accommodation, all of us will transform our practice in accommodating lenses because they are obviously better. And the transition will be as when we use in this spend these glasses, affected glasses, oval with a lot of optical aberrations, and we went into the use of monofocal lenses because they are better. So we are going to move to more to accommodate lenses in the future as far as the outcomes are confirmed, as I mentioned here. And this is something that is important. If you want to read something else. It's a book that we published uh, this year in February, a multifocal is the second edition of our book on this topic, the art and the practice is the name of this book with multifocal lenses that is co-edited with Joseph Pico from Israel. And I want to remember to you that we have this interesting course is for all of you interested in refractive cornea and cataract surgery. This lens offers, excuse me, this course 270 hours of teaching activities in multimedia with a university, degree in expert in, in, in at the level of university of university expert in the topic for any of you interested in the seat sub specialty go to the webpage see what is this course and this is directed by me and is conducted on full in english language thank you very much for your very kind attention i'm sorry if i have extended this talk too much thank you Thank you, Dr. Uh, Alio. It's, a, it's been an excellent uh, lecture, a very comprehensive review of this, this theme. And I am very uh, honored to have you with us in this meeting. Thank you once again very much. And I will proceed uh, to Dr. Luis Brenner, uh, who's also an expert uh, surgeon who's now in Norway and has, as Dr. Uh, Alio, uh, stated, being uh, a fellow in Spain as well. So, Dr. Brenner, if you would like to conduct your discussion, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Alio, for your lecture. Um, Dr. Roy was very important for me uh, because um, there are some things that uh, Dr. Yoto touched my that I could not forget. So I remember the first day we met, he told me what you don't document does not exist. So it's something that I took for myself. And uh, since uh, my fellowship in Alicante, I tried to uh, document everything I've done and to learn from them and to try to uh, improve uh, my results. So this is something that well, I will take for my life. But regarding the, our topic for today, it's uh, trifocal IOLs and corneal optical quality. It's interesting to have Dr. Radio here to, to learn a little bit from him uh, what he thinks about that. Um, now, last year, I have published a paper 
of uh, presby optic refract lens exchange with trifocal intraocular lenses after corneal laser vision correction. So we publish our results here in Mimira in Norway. And uh, something that we take a lot of care about the indication of this kind of procedure is the corneal optical quality. And this is something that uh, it was questioned uh, by the reviewers. They question what is our threshold for optical quality that we can uh, implant in that trifocal IOL. So we don't have this threshold. We don't have an uh, um, objective number. Uh, most because I think that's impossible to have this number. Uh, the vision process is complex, it's like, as uh, Dr. Elio has, has, sung, has said, that uh, it's, um, it's a neurologic process. It's not just optic, it's a data processing. So uh, it's difficult to give a number for this, but uh, I will just show some cases here. I think that's uh, interesting. So for example, um, this case, a patient which had a previous uh, laser correction in the cornea. When you can see here the topography, it seems a very good uh, topography when you check optical quality. This is another thing that I learned from Dr. Rio. This, uh, the use of uh, corneal wavefront analysis. I think it's uh, very important, especially when we indicate uh, trifocal IOLs. So here, if you have the, you can see here the high order aberrations, it's uh, 0 0.24 equivalent the focus. It's a pretty good optical quality. I think that's no problem at all to indicate a trifocal oil in this case. And uh, you will not see a lot of uh, compromise in this, uh, in the whole system optical, system, optical quality. And then you have this case here, you can see a little bit more, um, observable uh, ablation here, uh, some astigmatism. When you see the optical profile, you see that the high order aberrations in this case with six millimeters is 0 .7, 0 0.47. It's a good optical quality. Uh, from our experience, it's uh, optical quality that um, allows the implantation of a trifocal IOL. When you see this case, it's uh, probably a bitoric ab ablation. It's a uh, uh, compound hyperopic ablation here. When you see the optical quality, high order aberration 0 0.8, it's a pretty normal and no problem to indicate uh, a trifocal IOL. And this is just to show that this patient was implanted with a trifocal IOL with a high order aberrations of 0 0.36, the whole system uh, low refractive error. So it's a, it's a, a satisfied patient. And then you see this case here, we have uh, this uh, myopic ablation profile and then 0 0.68 of high order aberrations. Is this a patient that deserve uh, a contraindication? What's the threshold? It's very difficult to say what's the threshold here. Uh, this patient was uh, probably implanted with trifocal without a problem. But then you see this patient here with a hyperopic ablation profile. It's a very steep cornea. When you check the optical quality, this patient has a high order aberration of 0 0.85. Probably most of you will uh, contraindicate a trifocal oil in this case. And probably if this patient come to me today, I would contraindicate a trifocal IOL as well. But in this case, the patient was implanted with a trifocal IOL. And surprisingly, this patient is very, very satisfied with this implant. Uh, the patient has an incorrected distance visual acuity of 0 0.9 with an incorrected near visual acuity of, of Jagger 2. Um, and this is a very satisfied patient. patient. Because the vision process is more complex than just optics. And of course, because the aberrations also is difficult to give like a number because the aberrations interact between them and to increase or to reduce the optical performance. So 
uh, it's difficult to say like a, a number that will be, f work like as a threshold for uh, implantation of three four coil wells. And then you have this case, it's an ablation. Uh, you can see here uh, a little bit asymmetric maybe with a, a, a steep cornea uh, up in the superior part. And then we can say the optical quality is a patient with 0.62 of high order aberration, a little bit coma, uh, most of uh, spherical aberrations. And this patient was implanted with a 3 4 core well. The high order aberrations, the whole system is 0 0.66. And this patient uh, complains about optical quality. So what we can do now, uh, this patient, we try to use our platform to improve optical quality. And this patient was submitted to a, a trans PRK with a guided, with a Pyramis barometer guided ablation. And this is the post-operative cornea here. We can see the differential map. And you can see an improvement of the optical quality. Here is the post-operative refraction. Uh, the convolution is great. And we have here with the pyramids, we have a high order aberration of 0 0.38. And the patients, uh, it's almost uh, a metro here with a good uh, optical, optical quality. So um, we can use some uh, tools to correct the optical quality afterwards. The best is if you, we don't need that. So here's just to show the differential map, the wave from differential map with a pre-op high order aberration of 0 0.69 and the post-op with 0 0.37, an improvement with, of optical quality with uh, Pyramis guided ablation profiles here. Here it's a case, it's a, also in a previous uh, laser patient here, which was implanted with a trifocal OIL. Here's the profile, 0 0.32 of high order aberrations. And here you can see that the, the incision uh, have induced some kind of astigmatism here, the induction, the incision of uh, 135 degrees. And here is the, the profile, the optical quality. We can see that the high order aberrations increased to 0 0.84 with, because of uh, trifoil induction. We can see the trifoil of 0 0.75. And this is something that we have already discussed here in our uh, meeting that um, our incision is not free from uh, induction of high order aberrations. So we need to be a lot of, uh, we need to have care about our incision to don't um, worse the optical quality of the system. So here is the induction of the, the incision induction of astigmatism. And here's just compare the optical quality before the incision to the optical quality uh, after the incision. So it was shown by uh, the group of Pablo Artal that yes, the induction, the incision induce uh, trifoil. And this is another case with the induction of trifoil because of the incision. And here we have done a trans PRK uh, also for no way front guided to show the reduction of this trifoil. Here's just the differential map on the left side, and here's the comparison of the wave from the corneal wave front analysis. Uh, optical quality. Also, patients with uh, small optical zones, for example, with large pupils, um, they also should be contraindicated to trifocal, trifocal OILs, but the possibility is to do um, treatment a wave front guided treatment in order to increase the optical zone. So here's then uh, optical zone enlargement with the trans PRK uh, corner wave front guided. And here you can see the differential map. So a possibility here is try to improve the optical quality before implanting a uh, trifocal well. The high order version of this case was 0 0.59 and after the, the optical, uh, optical zone enlargement, it was 0 0.30. And here sometimes we have a patient with a, door, a bad optical quality. Uh, but if you check here, you have a high order aberration of 0.52. It was a patient implanted with uh, trifocal OIL. 
and the patient was not satisfied with the lens. But uh, the patient has not so many aberrations here. But then you would check the optical quality, the, the cornea itself. You can see a very bad optical quality in the cornea. Uh, the patient had a lot of complications of uh, epithelial ring growth and uh, uh, flap lifts. And in this case here, the Zernic polynomials, they, they are not able to measure the optical quality because this micro irregularities. So in this case, we performed a um, um, uh, trans PTK with uh, BSS, with a mask of BSS. And here you can see the improvement of the optical quality. Although the Zernic polyminals show a little bit uh, 0.62, it's the worst and previous 0.52, but uh, Zernic polyminals are not able to show this kind of uh, small irregularities. So uh, just a little bit, uh, just talking a little bit about optical quality. And uh, I would like to, to hear from Dr. Elio, what's his impression about uh, trifocal IOLs or premium IOLs in a patient submitted to previous laser, uh, corneal laser vision correction. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luis. I think that you did a great presentation and you, you have made a point, you know, in aberrated cornea multifocal lenses do not work because multifocal corneas basically loses contrast sensitivity. <clears throat> the lights disperse and this dispersion of light causes less lens entering the, into the uh, intraocular lens and this intraocular lens cannot perform properly. I, usually I, I never choose a multifocal intraocular lens for patients with a, a high of deprivation of more than 0.5 and especially more than one. You can have in this 0.5, two different uh, types. One, <clears throat> those cases in which you have positive spheric aberration because the patient has been the subject of previous LASIK or PRK, or those that have negative spheric aberration in which the patient has been the subject of uh, coronary refractive disorder. When the higher of the aberration is related to, uh, to a sphericity, you can compensate using, in case that you have positive spheric aberration, negative asphericity lenses, for instance, the, 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 the symphony and the, not, the new synchrony have negative aspherity of 0.27 and are good lenses for this type of aberrated spherical corneas, right? But you have coma, the problem is much more different because if the main part of this 0.5 to 1 uh, HOA uh, digit is because of coma, then you have almost no chances to get a happy patient. The, what you can do in these cases, if you, if you really feel brave to do that, is to use the oculentis lens the oculent lens has an intrinsic coma because remember the lens has an optical area that is for near increasing the, the curvature in one sector. This sector is implanted in the negative part of the coma aberration. This implantation is successful, but you have to first to, to, to tell the patient that it's going to be a difficult case and you will try to, to get not at the cost of far vision, near vision. And if you are uh, precise enough to, to place the lens in the comatic axis, but inverted, so the positive part of the comma should be coincidental with the flat part of the lens and the negative with the, with the, with the, with the, with the sector. This comma can work well. You, you, when I do this combination, I use the 1.5. I have never tried with the three because if you have too much comma, the patient is not going to have good vision anyway, you know? So this is the way in which I handle these cases, but I select the cases in this way, whether they, we have spherical or coma, spherical, you compensate the case of negative with negative, positive with negative sphericity. When you have a negative sphericity, I use a spherical lens, which is a positive spherical lens. And in coma, just the oculent is the one that you can implant using this uh, approach. Very nice. Um... It's interesting because here we we are a service that is main uh, approach is uh, presbyopic treatments. Mm -hmm. We have tried the IPCL trifocal with uh, bad with bad results. In fact, so we just stop with the IPCL. Uh, we are waiting now for the new ICL with uh, an extended depth of focus. I hope this uh, came uh, soon. 
we are uh, excited about this uh, possibility. But our main uh, market here is trifocal oil wells. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, uh, we need to know how to deal with this kind of uh, high order aberrations. Uh, and the fact that we have a good laser and uh, the possibility to treat also high order aberrations with laser is another good possibility. But uh, we know that the precision is not that good. So maybe in high uh, aberrated corners, maybe a possibility to do a previous laser treatment to correct high order aberrations and then to perform uh, three focal oil after that with a more regularized uh, cornea. I think that's also a possibility. But um, it's uh, difficult for our patients to, uh, to do that. So um, it's, uh, it's complicated. It's not that uh, straightforward, in fact. I, I agree, you know, I agree. And, and the, you, I think that those that, that are working with multifocal lenses <clears throat> clearly need to have access to an examine laser unit, you know, and, and not, not to any uh, one. It should, should be those that are of the, of the top range, the, the, what they are called the, the sixth generation uh, examine lasers, which are the Amaris uh, and uh, uh, definitely the, the ML90 in the last uh, form, even that they don't have a barometer and they cannot perform customized treatments <clears throat> and, they, and they are on platform is good, but they don't have a, either a total aberration. So the, the only one laser, as total eye aberrations measurement is the Amaris. All the others have topography and topography guided cannot really give to you the information you need with a multifocal lens because the multifocal lenses, when they have a spherical aberration as well, negative, they compensate in part. And so to have the, the full profile, you need to have a, a barometer. So the, the, this high level of specialization that we need now in multifocal lenses is clearly in the benefit of the outcome, you know, because if you select properly the patients and you have the tool to correct patients that in, in, in a way that they have a refractive surprise or they have a, a regular cornea, you, you have to use a, a laser and the, you have to get access to the ACML laser unit. Multifocal lasers are part of refractive surgery, clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is uh, someone which uh, wants to comment something? Dr. Wallace, Dr. Uh, Walton. I, I would like only to ask it, uh, Dr. Alior, if there is any equipment to measure uh, the sulcus to sulcus um, for using the Lumina length, uh, the accommodative length you showed. Yeah, you know, we use the OCT. We use the OCT. The, you can use the OCT in two ways. One is to measure the distance in between the limits of the epimetal epithelium of the iris. That length is the length of the sulcus. And you can use, a, if you use the Visantic, which is a normal scene, or any of the new ones, use the chromatic form. In the chromatic form, clearly you see the, the epimetal epithelium, and then line to, uh, S, uh, from S to H, this is the sulcus. Second is to, to measure directly the, the, the sulcus, which is something that is not easy uh, with the <clears throat> OCT scan, you can use the, the UVM, but UVMs, as you know, have composed images and you cannot get a reliable measurement. So what we use is OCT scan. The, the OCT scan that we use is the Cassia. The Cassia. Cassia is much better than the others because the, the problem with the MS39 and the, and the Visantis is that they don't have the penetration they, that, they, that they need in order to really uh, measure the sulcus. But with the Cassia, you can measure the sulcus. And this measurement is provided to the company and they make the lens for the sulcus in the meridian that you have chosen. Before we use the vertical one because the vertical is the shortest. Now we're using the horizontal. So in the new set of implants that we're doing now, we use the horizontal meridian for the lens and the meridian that we measure is that one. My, my only question, um, first of all, congratulations, Jorge. Beautiful, beautiful uh, lecture. Uh, we are used to to the cases that Brenner brings bring to us, and I'm sure he learned a lot from you. So we are twice thankful for you, uh, Brenner. Uh, my question for you, and I asked it in the chat: How do you avoid the wavefront laser treatment to correct the um, uh, multifocality that you have created with the IOL? 
Yeah, I was uh, answer this, <laughs> but uh, in fact, um, we don't observe the loss of uh, trifocality with uh, wavefront guided ablations, mainly because there are two different principles. One is the diffractive principle, which provides the mode focality, and another one is the high order aberrations. Uh, the trifocal lenses does not use high order aberrations to in, to increase the depth of focus. The diffractive optics is different from uh, high order aberrations. High order aberrations, we have discussed this uh, lay, uh, before, that uh, high order aberrations can increase depth of focus till a certain threshold. After that, it's exactly as Dr. Leo has uh, told today, after this threshold, the higher order versions will only induce degradation of optical quality. So if you have an optical system, which is free from high order versions, uh, the trifocality will be given by the diffractive optics of the lens. And the correction of those high order versions in the corner or in the optics or optical system will not uh, worsen the trifocality uh, from the IOL. I want, I want to, to take your opinion now uh, about one, one topic, which is refractive surgery after a multifocal lens, because in my hands is not that precise. You know, and the problem is that you, you never know which is the real refraction to correct. Uh, sometimes you make LASIK and the patient is left with the same refractive error, or you change the refractive error to others. So, which is, uh, Luis, which uh, you have probably the most experience, your experience with corneal refractive surgery following the uh, multifocal lens to treat refractive surprises. We, we are very aggressive here with this kind of uh, approach. We have today 12, 15% uh, of our cases submitted to trifocal oils need uh, enhancement with uh, eczema laser after the surgery. Uh, and you know that we, we have uh, good results, but uh, yes, it's difficult because those patients, they have very low ametropias. And uh, we observe, especially those with a little bit of hyperopia, 0 0.75 plus N plus one max, they keep the same uh, ametrope after the surgery, or we don't, we are not able to correct full especially those uh, low hyper ropes. Mm -hmm. My first impression was that it was maybe related to biomechanical properties of the corner after a flap, uh, af after we, we do a flap. Uh, I have done a lot of retreatments for those cases. So the patient is 0 0.75 plus, plus 0 0.75 plus N, we do the laser, the femto laser. The patient is well, first uh, post-operative consult, but uh, after that there is a regression. So we don't know that the regression is because of um, the ablation profile itself, or it's a biomechanical maybe to because of the flap. But uh, I observe after flap lift that the patients are a little bit more stable after that. So I think that probably is just a little bit related to biomechanical properties of the cornea of a flap cut. But uh, we have done a, a quality review here of these patients. And uh, the patients that was submitted to uh, laser enhancements, they are not so satisfied as the patients which get uh, emetropia after the first procedure. So we observe that uh, the, the satisfaction is very reduced after laser treatment. Uh, so two procedures, it's uh, worse for the patient. The precision is difficult, yes, absolute, but um, they are better than before the laser. This is fact also. Same experience, you know, we have, a, a, no, it's not as successful we published a paper a few years ago about this topic, 
with better results than we have now. It seems that we have increased the number and you have this type of cases, as you rightly mentioned, that you have a plus one patient is not able, obviously, to read properly because you are subtracting power for near. And finally, you do relation and the, and the patient has a plus one after it, which is frustrating. You know? uh, we have to treat these patients twice and the, the outcomes are very uh, questionable. This is my point. It's not a properly solved uh, case. I don't think it's biomechanical, you know, because uh, it should happen in every patient, but our results in elderly patients, even that they are not the same like in, in, like in normal patients, we don't have this problem with monofocal cases, lenses, with refractive surprise. Monofocal lenses, we are accurate, and plus minus 0.5 is 90%. Not, not with multifocus. The, the problem is, what is the, the refraction? What is the refraction of the patient? What are you measuring? Whether the patient is measuring a, a, an optical point that is uh, different than the one that used for far, is not, not, not a problem that I know the answer. Definitely, I have this problem, yeah, as, as you look. I'm, I'm using like a nomogram now. I'm trying to overcorrect those cases. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's uh, on the way. I'm trying to titrate a little bit what to do in those cases. The mm -hmm. uh, myopic error is a little bit more easy to treat, but this uh, hyperopic uh, refractive yeah. residual error, it's a little bit more tricky. I, I, I have mm -hmm. the same problems here, absolutely. Exactly. Total agreement. Uh, hello, Brenner and Dr. Liu. Uh, congratulations for the great presentation. Uh, Dr. Brenner, I would like to know about your great experience regarding refractor lens exchange. So uh, when, when uh, considering the results, they are pretty much attached to the, the IOL which is chosen, uh, I mean, the trifocal one, which is chosen to be implanted. Do you choose uh, the type of trifocal, or, I mean, from different brands, or do you have a specific choice for all your cases in terms of uh, trifocal brand? And if you do so, do you have a, a technical reason for choosing a specific brand? Um. We are a big chain of uh, refractive surgery and um, we don't work with this kind of uh, individualization. We work as um, for uh, some reasons, one size fits all trifocal as well. Mostly because of commercial uh, uh, background, I think that. So our platform today is the Fine Vision. Uh, we don't do a lot of research in this because we have tried uh, Fine Vision before we had um, from uh, 2010, it was most uh, Restore plus three. 2012, it started with the M plus, the length is M plus, but we had uh, more than 400 case with uh, uh, opaque lens with uh, opacity. And we need to change all this, those lenses. We have stopped with M plus, I think from 2015 and uh, from 2012, 2013, we are using mostly fine vision. The final vision gives us uh, very good results. We are very satisfied with this platform and our quality uh, sector does not see um, uh, an, uh, a reason to change our, the platform that's working very well. So we prefer to keep simple, to keep with this platform we trust. We have good results with that. And we try to improve our results in this platform, working with optimized constants and uh, nomograms based on our results. We have started with Panoptics. So uh, Panoptics is our second line now. We, we are very satisfied with Panoptics results. Uh, patients uh, demonstrate a very good uh, independence of glasses. So now we have almost 10% of our case with Panoptics uh, IOLs. And we have done um, uh, like a protocol uh, with uh, Synergy 
name lenses. And we observed that synergy lenses did not provide uh, better results than those we are uh, used to. So we did not change our platform. And most, I think that's because of um, commercial part. I think that we get a very good contract with uh, Final Vision and uh, the price and results, I think that uh, Final Vision is the best lens for, for us now. But uh, I think that we are doing some kind of uh, contracts and negotiations with uh, Panoptics. But it's, it's commercial after, after all. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so uh, if there are no other comments, I would like to thank once again our participants today, uh, especially Dr. Alia and Dr. Brenner, uh, who have uh, made their uh, availability for this, this session. And I'm sorry if we have extended a little bit of the time, as this is a theme that uh, raises many, many questions from our uh, viewers as well. So thank you very much. And Dr. Alio and Brenner, please, uh, if you would like to make any final remarks, I would like to thank everyone and wish a very nice week and a nice weekend. Yeah, I would like just to thank you, Dr. Alio. As I always see, say him, uh, my year in Alicante was uh, probably one of the best years in my life. So thank you very much for that. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much, Luis and friends. I hope we will see in Sao Paulo in a, in a better moment, you know, without all these environmental issues of the virus, because it's a wonderful place to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.